Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Damage Report. I'm Johnny Derola. It is Wednesday, and thus it is also here in the studio, JR Wednesdays. Hey JR. Wow, what's going on? How's it going? How are you feeling? Uh, I'm good. Thank you for uh, taking part and filling go. in for me during my week uh, when I was outside of the, I guess, the continental US anyway. Yeah, I'm saying don't mess up now. Puerto Rico is a territory, Hawaii is a state. Exactly. And Come I on. was in a state, and uh, but I was outside of you know my normal comfort zone and the, the bounds of the continental Do you feel like States. you want to move there now? Uh, no, I like LA. Damn. It was cool. I like visiting other places, but uh -huh. you know, once I find a place and I dig in, you can't get me out. I'm like, Nick, <laughs> gotta burn me out. Anyway, we got a lot that we're gonna be covering over the course of the show, not just ticks and why. We're gonna be talking about Donald Trump. There's some new polling, or is there? He says there isn't. Can you guess what kind of polling it is? <laughs> and uh, let's see, we've got John Stewart making an impassioned case for uh, the Victim Comp Compensation Fund for the first responders of 9 11. We're gonna show you some videos there. Uh, Julian Castro has an awesome uh, plan to uh, combat lead poisoning across the country. We've got some numbers there that are truly shocking. And we're also gonna be joined by a couple of different guests through the course of the hour. So it's gonna be a lot of fun, you're not gonna wanna miss it. But let's start off with a little bit of fun. Donald Trump has been on one lately. And uh, there could be a few reasons why Donald Trump has been going off on Twitter. I think though, the new news coming out of the New York Times having to do with internal campaign polling might be one of the reasons. So take a look at this. After being briefed on a devastating 17 state poll conducted by his campaign pollster, Tony Fabrizio, Mr. Trump told aides to deny that his internal polling showed him trailing Joe Biden in many of the states he needs to win. Even though he's also trailing in public polls from key states like Texas, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. So we're talking about two sets of polling here. Some is the public stuff that you've seen where he's trailing both Joe Biden and other candidates in a number of different states, important ones, ones he needs to win. And then the others are the internal polls that his campaign is spending a lot of money to conduct. Those ones we don't have direct access to, only the leaks, but we do know that he's apparently not happy with the results. That, that section finishes by saying, when top line details of the polling leaked, including numbers showing the president lagging in a cluster of critical Rust Belt states, Mr. Trump instructed aides to say publicly that other data showed him doing well. <laughs> and we're going to show you show him showing them how to do that in a second. Um, what do you think well, about Well, this is like mind? triple whammy for him. First of all, um, first of all, he's got to deal with the fact that this internal polling shows that. Mm -hmm. Oh, gut punch. Okay, then uh, the second strike is he has to try and convince all the people that work for him internally, hey, don't talk about this. I need you guys to uh, make sure you lie for me mm -hmm. publicly so that I don't look bad because that's all he's concerned about. Number three, um, third gut punch, oh, someone in the meeting that I told to not talk about this leaked it. Mm -hmm. To, that I did this, that I'm trying to tell them about the public, so the negative numbers come out. The fact that I'm uh, uh, butthurt over it has come out, and that I'm insecure about it all, it's all come out because he hates leaks. Mm -hmm. He hates that his internal people that are supposed to be afraid of him aren't necessarily afraid of him and actually probably hate him. So he can say the deep state is the people that don't like him, but once your campaign team is like, oh God, mm -hmm. let me just go ahead and talk to someone about this because this is crazy. Then he's got to deal with all three levels of this, and yeah. I love it. And uh, you know, uh, a million more needless caveats. Uh, the, the leaks, we don't know who they are. They could be lying, I guess. And we're supposed to always assume that Donald Trump is playing three or four or five dimensional chess. Maybe he's dispatched these leaks to tell us that the polling is showing him losing, even though the polling shows him winning, <laughs> because he wants everyone to get complacent for the next year and a half so that he can cruise through to victory. Well, wait a second. The or, good news is probably that. Um, currently, he's down in these polls, but then as soon as he unveils this policy, these, uh, his, his political platform for the next term, mm -hmm. it'll all turn around, right? Mm -hmm. I think I know what that platform's gonna be. I think I've been hearing about it for a few years. So uh, this is the reporting from the New York Times. Let's go directly to the most powerful man in the world who had this to say. The fake news has never been more dishonest than it is today. I have a feeling tomorrow it'll be more dishonest from your point of view. Uh, thank goodness we can fight back on capital, social, capital media. Their new weapon of choice is fake polling, sometimes referred to as suppression polls. Hmm. They suppress the numbers. Had it in 2016, but this is worse. The fake corrupt news media said they had a leak into polling done by my campaign, which by the way, and despite the phony and never ending witch hunt are the best numbers we have ever had. They reported fake numbers that they made up and don't even exist. We will win again. So first of all, I think that if he's going to do internal polling in the future, he should just have Rasmussen do it, because that at least will put his mind at ease a little bit. <laughs> um, I, it's possible. It's possible that the leak was lying. It's possible that reporters at the New York Times just 
made up polling data and all the public polls, including ones that we're gonna show you are all just made up. That's possible, Think about how I guess. Think about how exhausting it is to work with someone who um, denies reality and the truth. Or maybe they're in the position where they can actually change those polls or change people's opinions about them. And you work for them to help them do that. Mm -hmm. Yet the response is always, hey, cover it up, don't say anything, do this, do that. Imagine getting up in the morning at 6 a.m. You gotta go and work with this guy. Mm -hmm. And you're like, ugh. So yeah. we had some truth hit us the other day and we have to do something about it. But instead the solution from our dear leader is ignore it, lie about it, say it isn't true. Well, and I saw that in real time today where this morning Kellyanne Conway was on the news and she was saying that the polling shows them dominating and it's never been better. None of that's true, she's good at her job, I'll give her that. Um, we've got some more. It's I just an opportunity to, to do something. It's so crazy. If you're confronted with a problem in your work life, you have an opportunity to fix it. Mm -hmm. Instead, you just decide to do nothing. Yeah. Well, and I would also say that the Donald Trump is blessed by the fact that, at least in the large numbers, the economy is fine. Not in terms of wages mm -hmm. necessarily, but in terms of unemployment, it's fine. How easy would it be if you were Donald Trump, if I were Donald Trump, to just do a couple of symbolic things to get a few of the people who don't really pay attention to politics that much to cross over and support you? He could easily do it with a few things. He doesn't want to. Instead, he wants to try to get elected on cruelty and fear and xenophobia mm -hmm. and all of that, which I guess, in, to his credit, is more authentic for him. Um, and, and I just want to briefly say, from time to time, we will criticize individual polls. We just made a joke about Rasmussen. That joke is found in the fact that back in the 2016 cycle, out of I think 26 major pollsters, they were the least accurate. Okay, so we joke about their inaccuracy, which has been demonstrated historically over the course of years, if not decades. And in individual polls, you can dive into the cross tabs and you can take issue with the way that they conducted it. But I have no interest in the people, whether they started in 2016, some of them are still here, where they're just like, Polls don't mean anything. No poll means anything. I mean, after all, the polls showed that Hillary Clinton was supposed to win, and she didn't. <laughs> okay, the polls showed her winning by a couple of points nationally, which she did. And they showed when you got down into individual states that it was pretty close, and they only needed to be off by a point or two for him to have the extremely narrow wins that he did. If you wanna take that and run with it to say, I never have to take seriously, or even think seriously for a second about a poll, Feel free to do that. You'll probably you'll remove some of the cognitive load from the rest of your life. You're probably not going to be accurate in your analysis of politics, though. Anyway, let's move on to a little bit more of his whining and complaining because, as we said, it would be really easy for Donald Trump to to, to sail into a second term if he really wanted to, but he's taking a different route. Um, Unlike nearly every recent modern president, this is coming from the New York Times, by the way, who sought re-election, Mr. Trump rarely, if ever, speaks to aides about what he hopes to accomplish with what would be a hard one second term. His interest is entirely in the present and mostly on the crisis of the moment. That that's in line with what we know about yeah. his attention span, basically. Uh, he also has complained about traveling too much, but then lashed out at aides, demanding to know why am I not doing more rallies. He insists on having final approval over the songs on his campaign playlist, as well as the campaign merchandise. But he has never asked to see a budget for 2019. So oh my God. all of this is just, it's as flailing as one of those inflatable arm flailing tube <laughs> men that you see outside of car sales and stuff. It's like, I don't wanna travel, I'm really tired, get me to Miami, I wanna go to Boca or whatever. Um, I, I don't have any plan for what I'm gonna do with four more years of the presidency, but I'm really interested in what color the wall is gonna be and what sizes we stock on hats and socks on the website. I'm telling you, this is this is childlike. I'm gonna compare each levels of this to a kid, and, and my kid is way more uh, mature than this guy. Um, he complained about traveling too much. If you're in the car too long with my kid, he goes, ah, I'm so tired of driving all day. Okay, number one, he lashed out uh, about asking, when are we gonna do more rallies? He wants more parties. My kid's like, hey, I mean, I wanna have more parties. When am I gonna be able to go to my friend's house? You complain about going to your friends, have more fun. Oh, school is too long. Then he goes uh, after that because he's traveling too much, but then rallies, obviously those two things collide. Then he wants final approval of a song. My kid loves his playlist. He says, here, can I listen to music in the car? He always wants to take my music and play his, number three. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, he wants campaign merchandise, but never asks to see the budget. He's like, hey, I want to buy this. Hey, let me buy that $150 jersey. I said, do you have $150 to spend on this jersey? He doesn't care. Where does mm -hmm. money come from? It's, you. He's a child. <laughs> it's, it's every element of way he approaches his campaign, his life, his presidency mm -hmm. is like a kid. Yeah. Except when someone says, hey, Donnie, it doesn't work that way, he just falls on his back and starts screaming. At least mine goes, oh, yeah. okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and, uh, and, and it even gets into his political feuds. And so I, I wanna turn now just for a couple of minutes to, uh, to Joe Biden, okay? 
New polls coming out, Donald Trump obviously not happy with them. They show him losing to virtually everyone, but at least in this current poll, this is a Quinnipiac poll, he's losing worst to Joe Biden by a couple of points. So in this poll, Biden's up 53 to 40 over Trump. You have Sanders at 51 to 42, so a little bit closer. Harris and Warren both at 49 to his 41 or 42. Buttigieg and Booker not doing quite as well, which is actually interesting because in past polls, I've seen Harrison Warren not doing as well against Trump as candidates like Buttigieg and Booker. But now you see it's pretty close. But what stands out there is that he loses to everybody. This is some of the polling that he's been complaining about. But at least right now, Biden is beating him worse. Now understand, I am saying this as a person who Biden is not my number one. He ain't my number two, (laughs) he's not at number three. We'll talk about four or five or six at some point. So understand that, but I also can read numbers. And so I'm curious, is he scared of Joe Biden? Uh, This is a quote from the New York Times. In conversations with donors and allies, the president has continued to refer to him as feeble. Mr. Trump is 73, Biden's 76, so that three years is when you become feeble. And noted that he was part of the Washington establishment, giving Mr. Trump an opportunity to run as the outsider, even from his perch in the Oval Office. That's absurd, but I'm sure he will still do it. I mean, the fact that he's literally the president, he's gonna run as an outsider. We need to take back our country from whoever's been in charge. (laughs) And let's see, and a quote from San Nunberg, a guy who worked for Trump says, He views Biden as a failed vice president who's going to be savaged by the left in the primary to the point of an unelectability. He also doesn't believe he has energy. Some of that might be true. The energy thing is a little bit funny from a guy who lays in bed all day watching Fox News while eating filets of fish. Yeah. So you can always, and complains about traveling. He's definitely a guy who plays his hand and he talks and he shows who he's worried about. Mm-hmm. So of course he's worried about Biden. He looks at the numbers, he knows what's happening. Um, and also, I don't know if he's looked further than that to see all the rest of the numbers. It's just Biden has the, the bigger lead right now. And yeah, like you said, maybe there is some kind of a takedown that would happen within the primaries. That's what happens in primaries. People get exposed sometimes to their level of electability amongst those particular voters. Yeah. So uh, I mean, he sees it, but honestly, there's not much room right now, so he's got to do something else besides cry. Yeah, I, I thought about showing you some of the video uh, in the past day. He's been talking a lot about Biden. And what he's talking about mainly is how Biden won't stop talking about him while he won't stop talking about Biden. I love that sort of political bromance going on. Um, but he, uh, in talking about Biden, I don't know if he's actually worried about him as a candidate. I think that he thinks that he would be able to be attacked for a number of the same reasons we think mm-hmm. so. But he can look at a number and he could be worried about that. I will say 530 days out from an election, uh, these polls have zero predictive power, by the way. I believe even at 300, 250, they have virtually no predictive power. So we gotta wait on that. But I mean, when he attacks Biden and says he's low energy, he's too old, he's too dumb, it's difficult to not see that as him talking about the face he sees in the mirror. I mean, the projection is just so shallow and so predictable, so obvious and so constant. Um, To some extent, I think I like watching him attack candidates because at least it lets me get a little bit of a look into his own internal thought process to the extent that there is one. Okay, we're gonna take a short break. We come back, Parker Malloy is gonna be joining us from Media Matters to talk about the right wing censorship and how much they actually care about free speech after this. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un- the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un- the Republic or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time.
Over the last week, the internet has been abuzz with claims by the right wing that social media companies are censoring them or shadow banning them or suggesting people that aren't right wing. It's a lot of different things all bundled into one. And joining us now to break it down and respond is Parker Beloy, editor at large for Media Matters for America. Parker, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Uh, always glad to have you on, and I've been enjoying your uh, your recent postings, both both on Media Matters, which you've been doing for a long time, and also your Twitter threads having to do with these the claims of censorship and the, the instances of what they think classifies as censorship. So I'm curious. Uh, over the past week, there's been you know there's been controversy. YouTube has responded in a variety of flailing ways. Uh, what have you thought about the fallout from all this? Oh, it's just uh, it's it's just kind of been a uh, YouTube's response to because there was the video with. Uh, Steven Crowder uh, criticizing Carlos Maza, and then Carlos got sick of being called anti-gay slurs. Uh, so he criticized them on criticized YouTube on Twitter, and so then there was that that pushback. But it was YouTube responding over and over and over in Carlos's mentions as they were trying to tweak things uh, that shows how broken everything was. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, this this issue doesn't doesn't just go back a week. Obviously, this goes way way back, which is something that I I sort of. Uh, I sort of looked at in a recent Twitter thread where I, I looked back at how in 2016 there was this push to say that Facebook was discriminating against conservatives based on one article. And so then it go, it went from there to changing the Facebook algorithm. And then once the Facebook algorithm was changed, they, they removed the, the trending section and then Trump got elected. Mm-hmm. and. That didn't solve their problems because the answer is not that conservatives genuinely believe that they're being discriminated against. It's working the refs, which is to send this impression that they're being discriminated against, which is kind of the whole goal. And there's there's one line in in one of your threads that I just want to focus on where you say, and I think it's the most true thing, they will never stop claiming that they're being discriminated against. That they will always say that, they will always say that they're being censored regardless of what the algorithm does. And so I think like people can disagree on exactly what Facebook or Twitter or YouTube should do, but they should understand that lurking in the background, even if it might seem like occasionally these people are allies of convenience for you, their motivations are different and the end game is very different. So for that, I just wanna thank you for for some of your commentary in that area. Oh yeah, of course. And and with that, I, on, on that point, you again back to back to Facebook. If you if you look at what happened happened there after 2016, they didn't stop complaining. They kept complaining. They kept insisting that they were being discriminated against because you would see sites like Breitbart or The Daily Wire arguing that because their traffic went down coming from Facebook, which everyone's traffic went down because Facebook stopped showing so much news. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they argued that that was part of some anti-conservative bias, and people. Could post uh, stats showing that still conservative sites were dominating on these platforms, but they they weren't buying it. It didn't fit their narrative, and then mm. you you end up in a place where <laughs> Diamond and Silk are testifying before Congress because one of their videos got flagged for yeah. for a few moments or something along those lines. So the goal the goal is obviously to to totally game the system to create a world where bias exists. They're not trying to eliminate it. They're trying to Reinforce it. Yeah, it was a continue it and yeah. enshrine it. Um, yeah. And just to, to give people a, an idea of how broad this is, I mean, censorship or violation of First Amendment rights is, is supposed to, I, I grew up in school learning, have to do with the government infringing on individuals' rights. Um, but it goes as broad as this Ted Cruz was complaining on Twitter that he was only being suggested that he should follow other Democratic politicians <laughs> and maybe we should look into this. What did you think about that? Sometimes I don't know if if they're being honest with these things or if because Ted Ted Cruz is a smart guy. He's smarter than he puts on a lot of the times. <laughs> and in 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 that situation where Facebook was suggesting to follow certain uh, certain members of Congress who weren't um, you know who were Democrats, that section uh, which is on the search page, which is uh, where you'll see like the Twitter moments and stuff like that, that section tends to serve you a lot of examples of people you don't follow, so that you follow more people. And so the heading was Congress, and Ted Cruz was like, "Why am I not getting any Republicans?" It's probably because he already follows them. <laughs> I checked, and he didn't follow any of the Democrats that he listed. Mm-hmm. And whether it's that, or whether it's someone claiming that because a Wikipedia page was edited, and Google picked up what the Wikipedia page says, uh, that that's proof of Google's bias or something like that. There was that that instance last year where. 
uh, Kevin McCarthy thought that Google had changed it so that it said that the California Republican Party was, you know, a bunch of Nazis or something like that. But really, it was just a vandalized Wikipedia page that temporarily showed up on Google like that. So either people are inept at tech and are making these uh, making these complaints. Or they're banking on the fact that their audience, mm-hmm. uh, that their base, the people who they're trying to reach, that they don't care enough about yeah. tech or don't understand it. And uh, which they might be right. I don't know. Oh, or it could be both. And and I will also yeah. say that I think that Ted Cruz recently has discovered, and you've you've shown this recently by showing a bunch of screenshots from Dave Rubin's Twitter account. Um, on the right wing, all you have to do now is complain that you are being discriminated against on whatever platform. Just do it over and over and over again. And not only does it mean that those sites will try to rectify the situation, but your followers will eat it up because they desperately want to see themselves as victims of these tech giants. So I think that Ted Cruz might just be trying to do a cheap version of that. I wish that we had more time because I also want to talk to you about these these new claims that um, identifying racism are causing people to become racist. I saw you tweeting about this today. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll have you back on in the near future sure. to talk about that, Parker. Let's do that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna take a short break here. When we come back, uh, John Stewart was in D.C. yesterday to uh, fight for funding for the Victims Compensation Fund for 9/11 uh, first responders. We'll be talking about that after this. John Stewart was back in DC yesterday to once again fight for funding for the Victim Compensation Fund intended to correct many of the medical issues for first responders on 9-11 for the cancer and respiratory illnesses that they developed at that time. He needs to keep going there because they can't seem to fund it for more than a few years at a time. We've got a few different clips of him. First, he addresses the fact that at this particular committee meeting that he went to, many of the members weren't actually there. Behind me. A filled room of 9-11 first responders, and in front of me, a nearly empty Congress. Sick and dying, they brought themselves down here to speak to no one. It's shameful. It's an embarrassment to the country, and it is a stain on this institution. And you should be ashamed of yourselves for those that aren't here, but you won't be. Because accountability doesn't appear to be something that occurs in this chamber. So uh, you get right off the bat the impression this is strong. He takes this incredibly seriously. After the meeting, a number of the, the, the representatives had excuses for why some people weren't there. They're meeting with constituents, it's a subcommittee meeting, blah, 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 blah. They weren't there. They could have been there. They weren't there. That's the way I see it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the people who had their excuses for not being there, also, do they say, remember, never forget, on 9-11 every year, do they post, do they have speeches, do they put out statements saying how much they thank our first responders and remember the victims? If they say all that stuff, just skip that day, too. Mm-hmm. Skip that day and say, yeah, I'm sorry, I actually, I, I forgot today, so sometimes forget, only when I'm talking to constituents and doing yeah. something else. Be consistent. Don't use it only when it's politically helpful for you, because by the way, Oddly, if you show up and do something for our first responders, not only is it right, but it's also politically helpful. Yeah, it would do both at the same time. And we're gonna have some numbers on on how bad the problem is, but I I wanna get to more of the video just because it was so good. So here's more of John Stewart. The official FDNY response time to 9-11 was five seconds. Five seconds. That's how long it took for FDNY, for NYPD, for Port Authority, for EMS, to respond to an urgent need from the public, five seconds. Hundreds died in an instant. Thousands more poured in to continue to fight for their brothers and sisters. The breathing problem started almost immediately. And they were told they weren't sick, they were crazy. And then, as the illnesses got worse and things became more apparent, well, okay, you're sick, but it's not from the pile. And then, when the science became irrefutable, okay, it's the pile. But this is a New York issue. 
I don't know if we have the money. And I just want to briefly say there, I know a very popular show recently, like the highest rated HBO show ever is Chernobyl. Have you seen Chernobyl? No. So Chernobyl, like Broad Brush is about the response to Chernobyl, the disaster, but about governments hiding the truth of <coughs> the health effects of this sort of thing. And like my girlfriend pointed that out yesterday, and I was totally, or sorry, fiance, she was totally right. This is the exact same thing. They denied it and denied it year after year as people developed respiratory illnesses and cancer. And I don't know if you've heard this, but in those diseases, acting fast is really important. And so when you lose years of time, either in correctly identifying the illness or getting the money to actually do something about it, people will suffer and people will die that did not have to. And they're still doing that, by the way. He's in the room trying to convince them to stop doing it now. But it's just interesting that at a time when this pop culture like sensation, Chernobyl is out there, like we're seeing an instance of that. You can find others, but this is one in our very recent history. But there, he says the excuses always are, this is a New York problem, we don't have the money. It's always the way it works. Hey, you know what? And it comes back to, and also, uh, think about how many times uh, this president talks about um, how much he got a depleted military. Oh, our fighter jets. Oh, our depleted military. You know what I did? I threw tons and tons of cash at it, and then it fixed. Where did that, where does the tons of cash come from? Every time we start a new war, does anybody say, we don't have any money for it? Mm -hmm. Hey, let's wait on that. Hey, let's see what we're doing first. When it comes to things like actually helping constituents, Americans, first responders, in any situation, doesn't matter. Poor folks, folks who paid into uh, Social Security, folks who deserve health care, all of it in general. It's, where are you gonna get that money from? Mm -hmm. This, man, we're broke. America is broke. We're sick of throwing money at things when we don't have money for it. We have money for military, but we don't have money for this. But we start wars based off what happened after 9-11. Mm -hmm. We have money to throw money at that. We still are. Constantly, but still no money to throw at the people who tried to save folks. Yeah. The official who position of the folks. US government, our politicians, and most of the media is healing people's expensive, killing people's on the house. That's basically it, and you're not supposed to question yeah. it. Um, one more video uh, from Jon Stewart, uh, he, it, it just a, after this, watch the whole eight minutes. It's all great, but this is particularly powerful. And I am awfully tired of hearing that it's a 9-11 New York issue. Al-Qaeda didn't shout death to Tribeca. They attacked America and these men and women and their response to it is what brought our country back. It's what gave a reeling nation a solid foundation to stand back upon, to remind us of why this country is great, of why this country is worth fighting for. And you are ignoring them. And you can end it tomorrow. Why this bill isn't unanimous consent and a standalone issue is beyond my comprehension. That's 100% right. I mean, they, they, they've already, we've already been through this multiple times and they always, they fund it for a couple of years and they're like, ah, we'll, we'll get back around to it at some point. Uh, how, you would think in a country where, as we were just joking about, we never question funding for you know, a, a ship or a plane or whatever. We're always raising the military budget. The idea that this is not a slam dunk, even for like crudely callous jingoistic reasons, is incomprehensible, or you know, uh, as he said, beyond my comprehension. But the idea that even once all like the attention has been put on it time and again, that those people, and by the way, the, the House did, the House panel did unanimously pass it in the end. It's not done, it's not law, and we'll get to the difficulties that, that come. But that you have to have hearings, that you have to return to this every few years. Those people are dying of cancer. I have a feeling that those in five years who haven't died of it are still going to have those same health problems. Maybe we just fund it all now. Maybe we just say for these people, these first responders who are willing to go in to rush into buildings that were falling, hundreds of them died, more than hundreds, and others will be dying in the future. They always get health care, all of them. It should be right for all the humans, we're fighting for that. Every American, we're fighting for it. But at the very least, those people, how is that still a conversation that we need to return to every two years? Politicians are gonna politic, right? So anytime a politician does what they're gonna do, which is ignore problems that actually face people and would help them, um, it's an indictment on our on our on rest of the citizens of the country that allow them to do it. So if they believe they can get away with stuff because they're like, oh, they'll forget about it, they don't really care that much, and then they end up being right, that actually it indicts the rest of us that this can happen, and then these panels go on un, un, unfulfilled 
money isn't given to these type of situations, it means that we're endorsing that. And then after they leave and go, oh, they actually didn't care. Mm -hmm. Let's move on. Let's yeah. put our money somewhere else. Yeah, and at least in this case, I mean, would it have been unanimous without Jon Stewart? I'm not sure, they did the right thing though. I wanna read just two more quotes. The first is from Luis Alvarez, a former, is now retired detective and 9-11 first responder who said, less than 24 hours from now, I will be serving my 69th round of chemotherapy. I sh oh man, Jesus. I should not be here with you, but you made me come. You made me come because I will not stand by and watch as my friends with cancer from 9-11 like me, are valued less than anyone else. And uh, John Stewart said, they responded in five seconds, they did their jobs with courage, grace, tenacity, humility, 18 years later, do yours. And thankfully, in no small part, thanks to the first responders who testified there, the crowd that was there and him, um, they are, but passing that committee is just the first step. I have no doubt it'll pass the House. Hopefully we've got rational people in charge now, but there's still the Senate. And when asked about the legislation, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell sidestepped the issue saying he would have to take a look at the bill. Take, say, when people say they have to take a look at a bill or I have to read it or I'm not educated on that yet, politicians when they do, this, when they do say things like that. You know, it, it could be a multitude of things. They have read it and they don't wanna talk about it. They haven't read it and they don't give a damn. Um, or they're just not gonna get to it anyway. And they're like, let's just move this along. I need to get out of this press conference. I can't answer it, I can't answer it with any kind of real uh, backbone to it because I haven't read it yet and mm -hmm. you move on. So then someone should ask, are you gonna read it this afternoon, Mr. McConnell? I mean, when, when are you gonna get to it mm -hmm. then? He needs to have it in his schedule to read the bill. Um, so in, you know those stand up to cancer things they do at the baseball games, it's a big, any, any cancer things. And it points out how many people have actually been affected or known someone who has gone through uh, cancer treatments or has passed away from it. And everyone has a name on a card, mm -hmm. right? Think about it that way. The people you put on the stand up the cancer card, uh, these politicians don't care about. This first responder went through what, 69? Going through a 69th chemo treatment. Yeah. So if you've seen any of your family members or loved ones or friends go through cancer treatments and you've seen them after chemo, during, before and after, Think about it that way, and it's been this many years after, yeah. and we're not doing anything else about it. Imagine if your friend and family that's going through all the cancer treatments, if they got it because they're too busy saving other folks' lives, and this is our response. Are you, are you proud? Maybe Mitch McConnell cares, we don't know yet, he's gotta read it. He's gotta read the details to know if we should be paying for the health insurance of these first responders. And just just two quick things, I apologize, I know we're over, but remember when Ilhan Omar's comments were twisted to make it seem like she was making light of 9-11? Like how much work they did to twist those words to try to make her seem like she didn't care enough about this? Mitch McConnell, maybe he wants to give him health insurance. If that's not a 100, a 1000 times worse than anything Ilhan Omar or Rashida Tlaib ever said, I don't know what is. But I have a feeling which one the right wing will take seriously and which they won't. Finally, I just wanna say, because we're talking about this right now, I miss Jon Stewart. He really <laughs> is, he's one of the greats. Um, like combining great comedy with, with a broad base of knowledge, actual passion and authenticity, who, a guy who actually cares, who by the way, <coughs> could have kept doing it. Mm. He could have cashed in any number of different ways and he decided not to do that. He passed it on to other people. He's moved to just directing small projects and doing activism on the side. Just a, a great guy once again doing the right thing. Those Hollywood libs. It's Hollywood libs. Uh, okay, we're gonna take a short break. When we come back, more for you. <music> Joining us now is Matt Johnson, uh, press coordinator for Direct Action Everywhere. Matt, welcome to the Damage Report. Thanks so much for having me on, John, thrilled to be here. Uh, glad to have you here. So uh, recently there was a protest uh, in California at a duck farm and slaughterhouse. Uh, I've seen video of the protest, but can you tell us a little bit about what happened there? Yeah, absolutely. So Direct Action Everywhere, the animal rights network that I'm affiliated with, for literally years we've been submitting evidence of, of criminal animal cruelty to the relevant authorities um, in, in Sonoma County, California, regarding what's happening inside of some of these factory farms. And more recently, it was specifically this duck farm that you refer to. And unfortunately, the authorities have repeatedly just simply refused to take action um, when we've reported it to authorities at all levels. And so finally, um, ordinary people have said that uh, when our elected officials are not going to take action in the face of criminal animal cruelty, we're going to take action ourselves. So we went in there and we um, 
rescued some of these uh, sick and injured animals. And we also uh, locked ourselves, many activists locked themselves to these facilities in an act of civil disobedience to demand that our elected officials um, are held accountable to the will of the people. And uh, you're, you're seeing there uh, some of the, the footage of people being locked to uh, one of the, the, the bits of machinery that moves the ducks through. Um, and, and it looked like from the video that the machine was started up either intentionally or accidentally. Can you clarify that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and actually, we're not sure exactly how that, that came to happening. But yeah, we had these activists who um, locked themselves to this machinery. And then a few minutes later, uh, somehow this machinery was turned on. And we had an activist who um, was really viciously yanked up against uh, the machinery and kind of had his neck wedged up against a steel beam. And was his face was turning blue. It was a really scary situation. And uh, fortunately, he, he made it out you know, in, in reasonably okay shape. He was hospitalized with severe pain and nerve damage, but uh, could have been much worse. So I, I'm curious in these sorts of direct action protests. I mean, obviously there there was some risk there. He he was he was being injured, and uh, you're you're on machinery that can be dangerous. Um, where do you draw the line, and how much risk your members are are willing to take when engaging in these sorts of protests? Yeah, that's a great question. I think we really you know we take the precautions that we, we can make, and, and we're certainly going to kind of reevaluate things in, in light of what happened there. Uh, but ultimately, yeah, people are really inspired by this uh, growing movement and people are really motivated by what's happening in these farms and are willing to take risks to, you know, to not only their safety, but to their freedom. As we've seen, you know, 76, or excuse me, 79 activists um, were arrested on felony charges that day, in addition to many others who were facing felony charges previously. So, um, you know, with these are calculations we have to make, but certainly sacrifice is uh, an inevitable part of social change. Uh, what are the charges that your members are facing now? Um, it, it's, it's varied uh, amongst you know many instances by now, uh, but uh, burglary charges are, are very common, uh, theft charges, uh, that sort of a thing, and, as well as um, misdemeanor trespasses is also a common charge. So I'm also curious, I, one of the, the first things I remember doing when I started working here at TYT was I had to edit down some videos uh, that had been taken um, by an employee at a uh, pig processing plant. And uh, that was really difficult to watch and difficult to show people. And uh, in several states since then, there have been so-called ag gag laws that have made it uh, a crime to film what happens inside of these places. How does that change, um, I guess, the behavior or the prioritization of direct action by groups like yours when uh, less of that footage is sort of just coming out as a result of insiders? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I appreciate uh, the way the damage report has covered that issue with the ag gag laws. I'm actually from the state of Iowa, where the federal courts thankfully struck down the law in January, the ag gag law. And then just two months later, it was rushed through and passed by the Iowa um, legislature, where you know agriculture obviously looms large there. And as far as how that affects our work, it's really interesting because it has had, unfortunately, the intended impact of depressing this sort of whistleblowing activity. But I think there's actually a reverse effect happening whereby ordinary people are feeling empowered to elevate our voices where they are least welcome and to directly challenge this legal system, which is in complete misalignment with, with animal welfare, with, with environmental concerns around the animal agriculture's influence in climate change, and, and just frankly, the will of ordinary people. So um, I think that might actually be really backlashing and causing more of a, more activism in some of those areas, uh, but we'll see that with time. So there, there was another event, we only have a little bit of time, but um, back I believe on June 6th, uh, one of your members was arrested for approaching Jeff Bezos on stage. Can you tell us what happened in that, that case? Yeah, absolutely. So this is activist Priya Sahani. She was facing uh, seven felony charges related to this investigatory work for um, investigating chicken farms that supply to Amazon. And uh, she took her concerns directly to Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world, after he uh, and Amazon completely refused to engage on this issue. And so she approached him and uh, her, her thank you for, for approaching him about this uh, um, corporate misconduct was that she's now been slapped with two additional felonies. And one note I want to quick add too is that California law actually protects the actions that we're doing. So not only is what's happening inside of these farms criminal, but California Penal Code 597 actually says that ordinary citizens are empowered to go into these places and to protect animals in the same way that um, that rescuing a dog from a hot car by breaking a window isn't, isn't vandalism or isn't burglary. Um, going in and, and rescuing animals and helping them inside a factory farm is similarly protected by law. But unfortunately, um, the powers that be are, are, are not interested in enforcing that law and are in fact prosecuting the very people looking to do the right thing. 
Uh, well, best of luck to the many dozens of members who are facing uh, charges right now. And uh, Matt Johnson, thank you for joining us today on the show. Thank you so much, John. We're gonna take a short break here. When we come back, Julian Castro has a new plan to deal with lead poisoning across America. We'll give you the details after this. Democratic primary candidate Julian Castro has a new plan to deal with the country's still unresolved lead poisoning problem. He's got it on his website, there's a lot to it. We're just gonna give you a couple of the most important details because this is a huge issue that nobody talks about, nobody does anything about, and this plan looks pretty good, at least on its face. He would ask Congress to allocate $5 billion per year for 10 years to replace lead pipes and address lead contamination in paint and soil, quote, in areas of highest need, as well as an additional $100 million per year towards preventing lead poisoning in children. And for people whose blood has high levels of lead, Castro's plan includes provisions for treating lead poisoning under universal health care, mandatory lead testing for children under two years old, and support services including counseling, tutoring, education, and nutritional needs as well. And so he's really coming at this from, from two, two sides, from the people who are already poisoned because we have not done anything about this for the last half century, even though we've known how bad the problem is and we know what we need to do to fix it. He would provide health care for those people, although that can help, it will never repair the damage that has been done, especially to kids who were exposed at a young age. And also finally strip the pipes and the paint and the contaminated soil and things like that that continue to contaminate people every day, including right now as I'm reading this. It is an expensive thing, $50 billion might not be enough. It might only be a fraction of what's needed, but at least he is taking it seriously. It could drive a national conversation if people do take this seriously. And so you know, good on Julian Castro for actually suggesting it. So I mean, I can, I guess I'll guess that the next response will be, oh, where are you gonna get the money for this? Mm-hmm. These libs again, with their constant pushing for money to be thrown at things. You mean like Americans, the greatest country on earth, the one is better than others. Again, and we talked about it before, uh, Donald Trump promised $700 billion to the military on top of another 730 some odd billion dollars to the military mm-hmm. to do what? Is this building lead pipes? Is this uh, preventing children from getting sick from it? Uh, uh, so again, it only applies to the people that have the means to avoid the destruction of America. Mm-hmm. So we're making America great again by throwing more money at the military to destroy mm-hmm. other countries because that makes us great instead of investing it in ourselves. We have. Money to throw at things, we just don't have money to throw at the right things, yeah. is what we continue to see. No one's gonna blink twice when they hear that number. He bragged about that number. Mm-hmm. $700 billion because I didn't do anything, I had bone spurs. And he's not the only one, a lot of Republicans, and a good number of Democrats not only voted for it, but would brag about having voted to increase the military budget. Um, so yes, as you will point out, some at some point, it's just the name that occurs to me, Jake Tapper will say, but how do you pay for it? I would respond by, how do you pay for having a country where millions of your citizens have artificially lower IQs, learning disabilities, ADHD, all of those things? These are people that are gonna have health problems throughout their life. They're gonna be less productive on the job. They're not going to invent new services and products. They're not gonna start businesses necessarily. Think about all the economic damage that is done over the course of a half century or longer from these people having been permanently set back because they were exposed to lead when they were younger. And also understand that while this is a problem that is across America, obviously certain communities are far more affected by it. And that seems to be recognized in this plan. Um, I also want to say, by the way, when he talks about mandatory uh, testing for lead poisoning, you might think, well, they must do that, right? No, they they don't do that. Although in 2014, the CDC found that 4.2% of children tested had uh, elevated blood lead levels of, um, that's five, I think it's milligrams per deciliter uh, or greater. That's horrible. There's no safe level of blood, uh, of lead in the blood. And many, many states have missed significant percentages of the kids that are actually contaminated. We're talking 20, 30, 40, as high as 70 or 80% of kids who are contaminated, they get missed. So the testing is very, very needed. Um, JR, yeah. Ahead, thank you so ahead. much for joining me. Always good to have you on Wednesdays. We'll have you back on next week. Thank you to everybody who's been watching. Uh, if you haven't already left a review on iTunes, I know I've been telling you to do that and you, uh, some of you haven't. Maybe do it this time, and we'll see you tomorrow morning with a lot more news. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.